Amen. Amen and amen. What a wonderful day in God's neighborhood. Amen. We do welcome everyone here today and those that are online. We're so glad that you are here uh, with us via internet. And we're hoping via the Holy Spirit of God that you can feel the Holy Ghost in your homes or wherever you're watching from. As we continue on in our teaching this morning, I uh, there again got a good bit of material to try to cover. Uh, and so we'll, as we're beginning this, I, I've got just... Uh, a little different approach, perhaps a uh, little bit of different understanding to um, it's it's some of the same topics, but we're going to go deeper. So, um, of course, the title, uh, the understanding of this series, as is in the days of Noah. Uh, I was asked this past week, Alan, how long will this series last? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh my goodness, it's been going on for two thousand years. So we'll see. <laughs> But as, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, believe it or not, to believers, uh, that is the greatest uh, thing that we're looking forward to is the coming, second coming of Christ. And you can say, well, Alan, nobody's seen that for 2,000 years. But you know, there is going to be a generation that does see that, right. His coming. And I want us to look at something I started last week. I wanted to say this as an introduction. Bible prophecy is not meant to scare you, but to prepare you. A, uh, a lot of people say, well, Alan, it's a little scary. Well, it's, it just forces you into the security of Christ. I mean, it's, it's not to scare us. It's to prepare us. And uh, if, if it does scare us, we just need to... Uh, shore up our relationship with Jesus a little more <clears throat> because there'll be a lot of scary things in, in your life until you meet Jesus. Let me put it that way. <laughs> It'll be more than Bible prophecy coming to pass. I had introduced this idea of my dreams as purpose and this was an under, not an underlying, but it is an underlying theme that I was introducing you to a couple weeks ago in these end times uh, some of the seductions, I guess, I guess that might be a little too harsh, but I will, I'll use it for lack of a better term. Some of the seductions into missing the will of God is, is our dreams. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, and there again, I'm not against our dreams. I mean, we're, but when I say that, I almost can feel that it sounds sacrilegious because we've been taught so much in the last 30 years about your dreams, your dreams, your dreams. Um, and it's God joining your dreams. And I can, if I'm very spiritually practical about it, my dreams have not had a lot to do. Uh, they've had a little to do, but not a lot to do with my path of life. I said yes to Jesus when I was 13 years old, and I've been battling that path ever since. Now, I've told you before, if you know the picture of the footsteps of Jesus in the sand and the Jack Fork, little feet and then all of a sudden you got two where he's carrying you and I've told you mine it would be two drug feet right. in the sand and because the day Jesus uh, captured my heart it's like he's he's drugged me all the way uh, and I don't say that with great pride or anything I, I'm just like and a lot of my fighting the purpose of God in my life is I didn't realize it I didn't really know what I was doing right. and I had this great conflict well I thought I'm supposed to follow my dream this is what I want to do in my life. And um, I'm not, and I've tried to show in the last few weeks how God can, can incorporate our dreams into his purpose. But nonetheless, it's all about purpose and us finding our purpose and then only to discover God's purpose is greater than our dream, even though it can even include it at times. And sometimes it can be a distraction. So I, I gave you this little undercurrent thought to run with us in this uh, end time church that we find ourselves in because we all have a, have a 
a storyline going on differently in everybody's life. It's in here. It's personal to us. That's your dream. Where we're corporately together is in God's purpose. It's not necessarily even God's purpose for your life, even though it is, but we have a collective purpose in Christ. And it's us coming together in that collective purpose. Now, in a lot of the conflict is when I try to bring my dream into my purpose, and then you're not helping me fulfill my dream. Come on. And that's what happens in churches. A lot of people come to church, and they say, well, you're supposed to help me fulfill my dream. And that's, there again, it brings some conflict. Uh, when we yield our dreams into God's purpose, then that creates unity. And, and I'm, y'all got the Holy Ghost. You can fill in those blanks. Uh, now, if we live our lives in purpose, we will never fail. I got another little example uh, yeah, it's a giveaway with the Ten Commandments there. Moses, <laughs> we all know the life of Moses and uh, how Moses, he kind of started off as a, uh, uh, he was definitely a, a favored person, wouldn't you say? In the, in the, uh, that would be a true example of a person of privilege, yeah. would be Moses in the court of Pharaoh. Now, now watch this little thing here. He saw a bush that was on fire. I haven't had that one yet. Now, I have felt like I was on fire, but I hadn't seen the bush. It didn't burn. God spoke to him from the burning bush. God told him to go back to Egypt. God was going to use Moses to free uh, Israelite slaves. So <clears throat> we see as, as Moses, you know his story, but to keep him thinking here, uh, his opportunity that he had in Pharaoh's court versus his purpose uh, so God totally snatched him out of his favor, favor place, uh, and uh, gave him purpose. Now, what caused that purpose in Moses to take place was he had something down inside of him. You know, what started all this is when a Hebrew uh, slave, uh, you know, was killed and he went to his aid and all that. But there was something down in him that got offended, if you will, or it touched his heart. Uh, uh, of some kinship th that propelled him. Now, instead of responding with yes, sir, and taking off towards Egypt, Moses thought it would be a good idea to argue with God. You know, God, uh, Moses, he always felt like he wasn't qualified and all of the above. What Moses did not know in his life yet that God uses the unqualified to carry his purpose, if you can hear what I'm saying. It's just the way God does this thing. Now, here's another thought. God finally got angry at Moses when God calls you, don't make him mad. It's just a good idea. I have, have, you, has, have I ever made God mad? The answer is, I think I did. If he wasn't mad then, I don't want to see him mad because I have had several corrective points in my life and I tend to respond to him quicker now. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Does finding your purpose seem impossible? Now, here, that's something we want to understand. We got dreams, then we got purpose, and truthfully, dreams almost seem impossible, but purpose is definitely impossible. And so God, as we're, as we're trying to find God in these end times, it's going to create a situation in your life and my life that things are going to get more impossible as closer to the end we get. So therefore, we need to find ourselves in Christ uh, and in His purpose, because I gave you the scripture a few weeks ago, that all things work together for good. To, they work together for good because you're called in, unto His purpose. So the way God makes all things work good is not in your dreams, but in your, in your purpose. So that's important as we're moving. In these last days, if I had any, I want everybody, I have a compassionate heart. I want everybody to find their dreams. But in these last days, I'm compelled to say, okay, I think our safest place is in the middle of his purpose. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings about your dreams, but I am trying to call us into a safe place, I think, uh, which is in purpose. Now, it's important that we understand that deal. If not, we'll continuously have a conflict. Now, the end times church, as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us what shall these things be and what shall be the sign. Uh, tell us what these things shall be. What will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Now, we started discussing that uh, last week. 
and I, and we, I moved us into the greater sign. We got the, everything happening in the world, earthquakes, wars, rumors of war. We got all these things. But the greatest sign uh, is this. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So we started moving into this understanding uh, last week and, uh, of deception. Uh, you know, I gave you the little thing of the uh, playing cards and how man can deceive, uh, how we can be deceived by sleight of hand, if you will. But I also told you how it worked. And we're going to look at some things this week on deception, and I, I can't tell you how it works. The only thing I can tell you is we can be deceived. So I went, I started off, I was going to start off with an easier deception, and, and deception 101, if you will, and we're going to now move into uh, I'm going to give you your doctorate this morning on, on deception. Uh, so, now the greatest sign, deception is the number one thing that is mentioned in most Bible, uh, in the Bible in the end times. The fruit of deception, I hit this last week, is apostasy. Apostasy is what? An act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, recognize religious faith, uh, loyalty, defection. So, what, what happens Deception, all right, so I'm deceived. Okay, so what? All right, I'm deceived. The problem is deception equals something. It will actually equally, it will equal me departing from the faith. <clears throat> now, I can be under some deception now and not know it. So there's a part of me that's departed from the faith in that area that I've been deceived. Now, where am I usually deceived is where I want to compromise with God and His Word to make others acceptable. There's not, none of us are acceptable except through the cross of Christ, right? So there's nothing I can do that will help the situation of, of people that I love that don't know God. For some reason, we'd like to dumb it down so that they get it. Right, you're right? That's what we do with the gospel. We try to, we'd like to dumb it down so other people can get it. And, and the problem is, with that is, I don't care how dumb you are, you can't get it. it. It's not about being smart or dumb. It's about the Holy Ghost bringing conviction to our hearts and our lives. Totally different process. But when we try to work it through the mind of Gnosticism, of, of, of knowledge, that it just, it's a totally different thing. Now, apostasy is a sign of the end times. In Matthew 24, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many because iniquity or lawlessness, it says, shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. First Timothy, now the Spirit speaketh expressively that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. All right, we see that, depart from the faith. <clears throat> Giving heed to seducing spirits. How, how do we depart? Seducing spirits. Doctrines of devils. Now, when, when I read that first, firsthand and when I read that, well, that's not me. I'm not, uh, I'm not being seduced. or I, I'm not going to fool with doctrines of devils. I don't know about you. So he must be talking about somebody else. Now, part of deception is we don't understand what seducing spirits are and we don't understand what doctrines of, of devils are. Uh, those two things, that automatically I feel like on the outside, well, that's not me. Uh, and... But that's part of the problem. We, we don't know what these things, and that's part of this seduction. Uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So we got this thing of being departed from the faith, and I stuck this in there. You can think you are still in the faith, but yet depart because you have been seduced. In other words, we think we're still in the faith. Well, we, well, we are. Uh, there again, once saved, I always saved. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, uh, you can think you're still in the faith, but yet depart because you have been seduced. Now, there, you've got to look around our world today. Are there some, te uh, some churches teaching this? Yeah, yeah, some churches are thinking, yeah, we're in the faith, but we've been seduced, so we're now teaching things that normally we wouldn't have taught 10 years ago, right? So, so something shifted, something's happened. That's what we call uh, seduction here. Now, it is a common theme for the early epistles to address this problem. This was because this has always been the major problem for 2,000 years. Every time it is addressed, it is with the warning about deception uh, will soon try to creep in. 
This is talking about end times uh, conversation. Every time it's used about end times, that's the reason I say that deception is the number one thing. It, always either before or right after uh, most of the examples, it is, uh, speaks about deception. Deception leads to the uh, death of discernment. And this is what happens in the church. Now, can I be honest with you? There's some things that I declare that God's Word says. It sounds a little harsh to me when I'm saying it because there's something in me. There's a lawyer in me that wants to come to the defense of the sinner. It just is. Uh, if, if, if I if in a conversation about homosexuality and somebody's coming down hard on it, I'll usually take the other side. You say, Alan, you're, how do you do that? I'll, I'll try to do it biblically. I'll be honest with you. I do try to do it biblically, but, but there's something in me uh, that wants to take up uh, for the sinner uh, when I'm in a conversation that uh, I know there's a, a legalistic spirit in, in the room. And, uh, and we can say, so, so I mean, I understand that, but I also understand that when we're in the psychologically spiritual mode, if you will, of trying to defend the sinner, uh, uh, what... The last situation I was in, the Holy Ghost said, call out the legalism, don't defend the sin. That's what he said to me. So the truth is, I didn't have enough guts to call out the sin, the, the legalism. Now, just so you'll know how it did end, I did, because when I hear the Holy Ghost, I'm going to do it. I'm just that, that's, that's something about me that scares people. If a Holy Ghost tells me, I'm like, really, and then you're the same way, we're just, we're just going to do it. So anyway, I want us to, to start thinking about that. You are led into a state of not being uh, sensitive to important things, and, that, and that's me. That's the reason I put it up there. Uh, uh, there's some things I need to be sensitive to that I'm not as sensitive to. Uh, there's a situation uh, this week in which um, uh, this uh, individual was having feelings for another person that was not their, uh, they weren't married to or wasn't their spouse or whatever. And I end this conversation. In the, in the course of the conversation, the Lord spoke to me and said, Alan, 10% of the people in your church, said your church, are battling feelings uh, of, with someone they shouldn't be battling feelings with. Oh, wow. I'm like, wow. are you got God? Surely not. And then he said, yeah, 10% of the world is going through it right now of always having feelings for the, uh, somebody else's husband or wife or something. In other words, somebody you shouldn't be having feelings for, whether it be, uh, we'll, we like to talk about homosexuality and all that, but what about a man who's, who's uh, uh, having feelings for another man's wife? Is uh, that any worse than homosexuality or whatever? I, I don't know if we have to say it's worse or better or whatever. We don't have to categorize it. It doesn't change anything. It's sin and, and it's wrong. And so that's what happens to us. Our sensitivity to important things starts to change. And uh, uh, in, other, in some circles we could say, well, I'm a Christian light or I'm a cool Christian because I'm sensitive to everybody's needs. Uh, it would be that God was that sensitive. Uh, <laughs> my, my personal experience there again. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll not do that one. All right. Deception is a virus to your perceptions. Now, deception is stealth and action. We went over this a little bit last week, and I want to hit it again, but from a different angle. Uh, deception is stealth and action. It changes the foundation upon which a thought process begins to accomplish a changed perception of truth. So I did the card trick last week where I changed the... Actually, how did I get your card? I changed the foundation. I changed the, uh, all the cards. So I got, I, I got everybody, and everybody's like, uh, how many? And I had you raise your hands. How many cards? Everybody raised their hands. Oh, I guessed them all right. So I guess everybody had the same card? No, I deceived you because I changed the foundation. When foundations change, you're in deception. That's the reason when we change from the Word of God as the foundation for this country, to give you a broad one, when we come off of these foundations, if you start arguing uh, uh, abortion uh, and you've left the foundation, uh, murder is wrong. It's sin. It's just all. Murder, I don't, how you want to dress it up, you know. 
it's just murder sin. So, so when you leave that foundation and enter into another argument, uh, you're, gonna, you're entering deception. So you can try, have you ever tried to win an argue, argument with deception? How's that supposed to work? Uh, you can't, you know, no, uh, to murder someone is wrong. It's sin. That's, that's the foundation. You don't ever change that card is my point. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you something. I've done this with a lot of people in here. I'm going to show a picture. A lot of you have seen it. But I want you to see it and make I want because some haven't seen it. But I, there again, if you have seen it, I still want you to catch my point. Not that you can see the picture. That's not my point. But I'm, I'm going to show it here. Uh, now, I've done this before, like I say, but that's a picture. Now, how many people see an ugly woman, kind of a hag, ugly woman? I want to raise your hands right quickly. Okay. How many people see a pretty woman? Okay. All right. Now, how many see people see both women? Okay. How many people seen me do this before? Oh, about the same amount that see both women. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Now, if you haven't seen this before, uh, raise your hand. If you haven't seen it before, so I know who I'm working with. Okay. How many of you now see the old woman but can't see the pretty woman? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Now here's the, the pretty woman is looking the other way. You see, uh, the eyelash of the ugly woman is also the eyelash of the pretty woman. Uh, the nose of the ugly woman is the chin of the pretty woman looking the other way. Everybody see that? So, but now, okay, if you can see it. Now, here's the point. The point is that's a set of, that is something that you can see. And I can say, who sees a pretty woman? Then you raise your hand. Well, that's the truth, correct? Then I can say, all right, how many people see an ugly woman? Uh, that's their truth, right? There's two different takes on the same set of lines on that paper. Or to put it another way, with one picture, I have two distinct truths. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you about deception. I told you that I taught you last week if I pulled the cards away, and then I taught you how the trick worked. Now, this is another trick, but how does it work? The truth is, that's a picture of one woman. Now, if you look at the ugly woman, and you see both women, that one tends to take over the picture. I don't do something religious. Really. No, I see the pretty woman. That's all I can see. I've, I've had people, I've said, you're lying. Yeah. I know you're trying to be do the religious thing. If you look at that picture, the ugly woman takes it over. It has to because it's the bigger part of the portrait. You see, it's, it's the bigger part of the portrait. So the bigger part of the portrait tends to be the focus of what you mainly see. So if you listen to news media today, the bigger part of the portrait's the ugly woman, right? So it's going to kind of take over your prophetic vision, if you will. Everything's ugly, right? So we're, we're going to change this a little bit. All right, let's say, what if God's doing some stuff and it's pretty, right? So in one portrait, we have two sets of truths. Are you with me? Now, one's a truth that equals a bad outcome, and the other one's a truth that equals a good outcome. But you got to carry it to the conclusion to make your choice of which one you want to use. So you can be in an argument about a truth about of abortion. Yes, but this woman's got this and she's got this and she's got that. You can get into that argument. Normally, it's going to have a bad outcome for her and the child. So when I see something that looks like two com com combating or two truths battling for my attention, the prophetic eye quickly can see the outcome. Are you with me? So I'm trying to show us how deception works. How do I know which truth to choose? 
I can't tell you one's a lie and one's the truth because they're both there. The truth is they're both there. Are you with me? We're going just a little deeper into deception. Now, two truths at the same time. Which one do you choose? Now, it's not that you deny that they're both there. But again, not where, this is it's the way the deception works. It's making a play on truth. It's going to appear. So you look at the outcome. The Word of God shows us outcome. You can't be headed on, the, on a path in the wrong, wrong direction and end up somewhere you think else. I can't go on the road to Taylorsville and just because today I want to identify with Statesville, I'm going to say, well, but I'm going to end up in Statesville. Right? It, it, okay, let me keep going here. Unless I go, which truth will you follow is the question. All right, now you're going to see two truths. Now, when I showed you the card trick, there wasn't in your mind but one truth. When I showed you the card trick, there wasn't but one truth. But did you consider another truth called deception? I deceived you with the truth. The truth is, I did remove your card. Right? To those of you that were here. The truth is, I did remove your card. But there was an outcome. I deceived you. And, what, and the deception would create you to think that I'm some big prophet that knew your card. But if I didn't tell you how it works, you could leave from here thinking, oh boy, he's a great prophet. It's deception. Now, I tied that into a prophet for a reason as we move forward here. The basis of an illusion is to get you to concentrate on what appears to be good. That's what it does. I found this little picture here. It does a good illustration. Illusion versus illusion. Uh, illusion. <laughs> An illusion is a subtle reference to something. Now, we're talking about uh, illusion. Ill illusion is a deceptive appearance. You see? And... And so what we're in, this deception, is about illusions here. In other words, we're having a deceptive... It, it, it's okay, now you've got that. All right, let's move on. It's all about attention diversion. That's what it's about. It's about attention diversion. So if I can get your attention over here and off the Word of God, then we're going to argue this thing. I've diverted your attention. You've got to keep your attention on the Word of God because the Word of God's the foundation Come on. That's good. in which you're going to make your argument or conversation about. It's the Word of God. You can say, well, Alan, they don't, they're not going to accept the Word of God. I don't care. You still refer to the Word. This is the foundation. This is what the Don't say it's the Word of God. Just say it's wrong to murder. Thou shalt not kill. You don't have to say thou shalt not kill. You just say, don't, it's, we don't murder people. It's not, that's not, that's got to be wrong to murder people. So you stay, but you got to stick on the foundation if you're going to carry on a conversation. It's all about diversion. Attention diversion is the key to illusion. Now, if the card trick, that's what I did. That's, that's, that's what it does to us. <clears throat> if our minds are filled with useless things, we are more open to illusions no matter how smart you are. Are you with me? Now, this day that we're living in, if you just want to fill your mind with a lot of... Listen, anybody ever heard of TikTok? <laughs> it's... It's seen after, it's, it's, it's little video, 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 full of useless things. It is. Very addictive. Why is it addictive? Because there's a spirit behind it. You say, oh, Alan, there's not a spirit behind everything. Well, most things there are. I'm sorry as I can be. I'm as sorry as I can be. You'll get addictive to it. Anything that's addictive has a spirit behind it whether it be alcohol, whether it be lying, whether it be lust, uh, whether it be TikTok. If it's addictive, 
What makes it addictive is that spirit is drawing you in like gravity. The pull of gra spiritual gravity. That's what, that's what it does. It, it, that's how you know it's a demon. It's trying to draw you in like gravity. It's just like it's against your will. How do you, t when the Spirit of God calls us, right, or draws us, it doesn't feel like gravity. It feels like you're going up, not down. Now, move on. The more comfortable we become with something, the less we think about the danger of it. This is the way we work more comfortable. We left our foundational argument and we started getting to another conversation. So now we've had those conversations for a year. So we're now we're more comfortable about, uh, you'd, you'd be surprised how many Christians are more acceptable to all of the transgender, LBGQ, 9 MOUSEs that are out there. How Christians today now are, are more acceptable with it. Uh, uh, why? It's because we just got more comfortable with it and Satan knows that. The more he puts it out there, the more comfortable you get, and, and, and the more it seems to be, well, it's okay. We've been talking about it for five years, and the world's still here, so surely it's not too bad. That's what happens. Though. We, the more comfortable we become with something, um, the less we... It's just like uh, that's the way sin does us. Take, pick any sin you want to. The more we're into that sin, the more comfortable we are with it. We don't... We start losing, and we're... We're losing our discernment to see the danger that we're in. That's what happens. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, sinking whom he may devour. Do you remember that's what happened with who? Nation Israel. Right? They didn't think it was all that bad. I can sit there and tell you, how in the world did they go from God to a golden calf so, uh, so quickly? I, well, here's how. Uh, to be sober means to concentrate on what's important. Israel quit concentrating on what was important. So when he says to be sober, now just get that. What he's saying is concentrate on what's important. Well, I'm tired of concentrating on what's important, Alan. Well, go build you a golden calf is all I know. The Bible says, be sober. And then it says, be vigilant, keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. That's what vigilant means. So, so to be sober means to concentrate on what's important, vigilant, keeping uh, careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. So as a Bible teacher here in front of you of this church, it, that's what is my job to do this. And I had uh, here several months ago, somebody said, well, Alan, why don't, can you not teach us on something that's good? And I said, well, I thought the truth was good. I mean, I, I, I know that it seems like a downer, but it's supposed to be an upper. Truth that sets us, sets us free. And I'm sorry, this is the way I'm wired by God, I guess. I, it's just, I, I can't help it. It's just me. Now, first and foremost, uh, let's look at this. And Jesus answered and said unto them again, he said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, let's look at deceive many. Of a person calls someone to believe something that is not true, uh, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. That's what deceive, deceive that's what that, what that term uh, there means. Now, keeping that in mind, look at this. End times direction uh, in the world is to create another Jesus. Now, this is, in deception, there's a goal to it. The goal is to create another Jesus. This, this is the whole, everything I said this morning is leading us to this statement. Is everybody with me? Yeah. It's this statement. End times direction in the world is to create another Jesus. Why deception? Why all this? Well, it's not all about you other than it's all about creating another Jesus. This is the issue. So, well, boy, I'm glad that's not me because... I believe in Jesus. We're going to see. Just because you say you believe in Jesus does not really mean anything until you say which one. I thought you'd appreciate that. Which one? You say, well, Alan, why would you ask me? I don't get it. Why would you ask me which one? And I hear Paul, Paul 
gave a warning to the Corinthian church about which one. He, so, so we got to look and we got to look into this thing. Second Corinthians eleven three. But I fear lest by any means the serpent beguiled Eve through this subtlety, that, uh, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. So this is, now we know the Corinthian church is probably as charismatic as you can get. They were way out there when he, before they got saved, you know, they were. So he, he said, but then he says, he said, why aren't you going, you're being, your minds are being corrupted. Now, he went on to say, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, which ye have not received, or another gospel. Okay, we're going from another Jesus also to another gospel. Right. Now I'm teaching you as a prophetic people this terminology about deception in the end time church. You say, yeah, but Paul said that 2,000 years. It's because we've been in the end time for 2,000 years. Right. It's just as real today as it was then. It's just as real then as it is today. So, now, so, so look at it. So we get, we're introduced now to another Jesus is the big one for deception. And, and it says another spirit. Then it goes on to say another gospel. Now, uh, what, uh, all right, we did that, the slyness, is, the subtility there is slyness and design, artifice, guile, a cunning design, artifice, or a trick. So we know that the Satan tricked Eve. You say, well, and she, she, she was just mean, made a bad choice. I, not, excuse me, she was tricked. She's Call it what you want to, she is tricked. You can blame her all you want to, she is tricked. Now the question is, Paul's comparing it to that and saying, hey, don't be tricked, don't be deceived here. It's going to be the same spirit that deceived Eve. That's the reason he brings in this other Jesus. You see, it's the same thing. He wants us to believe we're gods. Another gospel. Same lie. He's tied it into Genesis with, he's just saying, it's the same puppy. Now, so as we go on, it's for simplicity. The state of being simple, uncomplicated, or uncompounded lack of subtlety. The gospel that we know is simple. I sinned, I repent, he died, I'm saved. When people come along and try to make that complicated, It's not sometimes, it is another Jesus. Now I'm going to show you how it works. And then we got the other gospel, and I said this is the challenge of the church today, is the other gospel. So here we find what sort of state is this end time church in. Here's the state that it's in. It's the same spirits coming against the church today that tricked Eve. And it's trying to bring in another Jesus It'll do it through another spirit. So now here's Paul's warning to the Galatians. You know, the Galatian church, I mean, their big deal was deception. And in the first part of the book of Galatians, I mean, their big deal, Paul had just left them when he wrote Galatians. He hadn't been gone long. The reason he wrote it is because they had been deceived so quickly. And he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ. You see that? That's the reason he was writing. He said, what's the deal? I was just there. Unto another gospel, which is not another, uh, but there should, in other words, he said, there's not really another, is what he's saying, uh, but there be some that trouble you and that would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's amazing. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that you have received, let him be accursed. So all of a sudden, okay, we see deception. The big, the big deal, the big sign of the end is deception. Now we're seeing the deception is in, in a Jesus and in a gospel. Then he comes into here and he says, I marvel. 
What does that mean? He was amazed that they had already abandoned the grace doctrines the Holy Spirit had given them. So, you, so here's the church. We've got to understand. There's, there's grace gospels. There's doctrines the Holy Ghost has given us. When you find yourself being enticed to move away from those things, you need to, it's a warning to us. Now let's look at this other thing, grace of Christ. Paul had visited these pagan people lost in their idolatry. The Galatians, was, they were pretty tough. Uh, he had preached to them the gospel of God's grace. They took it hook, line, and seeker. They let, in other words, in all of these pagan idolatry things, you had to do this, you had to sacrifice this, you had to do this, you had to do And then the apostle Paul comes along and says, listen, this gospel is God's done it all for you. Just receive the truth and the truth shall set you free. They did and it did. But it wasn't long until seduction started coming back in. This same spirit that came against Eve was coming against the Galatian church in trickery. So you can be as devout as you think you can be. It's not about being devout. It is, can you be deceived or tricked or not? That's the question. Are you with me? Now, watch this. Paul asked in chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, I don't know why I just had a flood of the Holy Ghost right there. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? In the great deception, the Galatians desired to be back under a law. They preferred works religion to the grace of God. Now watch this. The two great contrasting systems in the Bible are law and grace. The law has been fulfilled in Christ and it's in His grace. So he's saying the deception is you're leaving this doctrine that He gave them about the grace of Christ, the grace of God. And the deception here was the law. Anybody see that? Well, how good's the law if it's a deceptor unto Christ, to grace? Well, there, there, there's a reason. <clears throat> Let me go right there. The law has been fulfilled in Christ. This is His grace. Now, you, I know you know this, but let me remind you. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. So your faith in Christ includes Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. So if you think you got to do the law, you're abandoning the overall truth that Christ fulfilled the law. That's deceptive. Now you say, well, okay, Alan, I got it. Now here's the issue. The power of the gospel is in the love of God. You've watered down the love of God by thinking you can do law. The deception is if you do law, you'll be more spiritual. It deceives the truth of the love of God. We can't get to the love of God. We can't experience God's love. Why? We've been deceived. We think we can work it. It's a deception. I was in, in uh, Toronto, and I've told you this before, and I was uh, in inter interviewer mode at that time. <laughs> which I'll not go into it, which I didn't say in. But when I was in the interviewing mode, there was people on the floor flopping and carrying on, and you know, that's how Toronto got its bad name. And, and it'd be just a shaking like this. And I went up to this one guy, some of you heard me say it before, and I said, what's happening to you? He said, God loves me. I'm like, what in the world? But then the Holy Ghost was teaching me and showed me. He was so encountering the love of God that it's about more than he could stand. And he wasn't getting rid of a drop or two. So there's something to the love of God that he had that I didn't. He was encountering something that I wasn't. Before I come home, I got a little of it, but at that time I hadn't. But I knew 
that there's something more to this phrase, the love of God, than I was getting. But I wanted it. And I cannot stand here and tell you I can exhaust it and tell. I've just told you all I know about it. I, I've just told you. But the key is, the deception is we have to have faith in Christ that he fulfilled all of that, which is the door that opens me to walk into the presence and the love of God. So when I think I'm contributing, I'm being deceived. All right, here we go. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, we can throw all these words around all we want to, but you've got to make a distinction in law and grace. You've got to make a distinction. That's the reason I say if you don't make distinctions, you can be deceived. The world today is trying to erase distinctions. There's not male, you know what, yada, yada, yada. It's trying to erase distinctions. I had a guy, well, the guy's Jason, was down in Atlanta yesterday at a knife show. Big 75,000 people there. He just made a shot, a picture, just shoot, sent it to me. No words needed. There was a man there with a headset on with ears. He was identifying, I don't know if he was a, a skunk or, 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 a, or a raccoon or what. And he had a tail stuck out and he was dragging along. And he, had, he was identifying to some animal. Walking around the show like that's normal. I didn't ask him if any more animals down there. Can you believe? Is it? Am I crazy, or is that normal? Is something off here? You got to make distinctions. I'm telling you, the world's trying to blur the distinctions, and what's happening in the church is we're is we're blurring things. People are trying to get back to God, but they're trying to do it out of law. But anyway, let's just watch and see what the Bible says about it here. First Corinthians says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. <coughs> now abideth, and the greatest of these is what? Love. I'm telling you, church, we have no idea what that means. Right. I'm just telling you. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. We have no idea what this love of God means. Right. Now, we're going to get into it a little bit more here. Paul, warning was, there were those that wanted to add to the gospel. Now, that's where we're coming at. That was his warning to these people. I know you are justified by faith. If you keep the law also, you will be super spiritual. <clears throat> and so, the enticement. What causes us to be deceived. Well, one of them is the word but. It's a deceptive phrase, but if you. If we allow that deceptive phrase to entice us, but if you. <coughs> but is used to introduce a phrase or a clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned. But. That's what happens to us. No, he, no, he, Jesus died on the cross, but. Now, I'm trying to make a distinction here about the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God is a complete gospel. Right. Yes. Now, remember, yeah, the gospel of the grace of God includes all the gospels before then. It includes it. Jesus did it all. Now, here we go. Deception is used to disconnect us from God and His Word. To commingle is to dilute. That's what the deception's trying to do. It's trying to, once we start going into legalism and law and all of that, that separates us from God. Now we think we're big, but it's a deception. Deception is our enemy. It says this in Matthew Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus answered unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments saying all the law and the prophets. It's getting back into this love thing. Deception, and this I've got to stop. Deception is an act of spiritual warfare. I'll have to start here uh, next week. Now, 
And just in the next few slides, and I'm tempted to punch the button, but I will not. It is 1031. I'm covering politics. Uh -huh, that's right. You want to see how we're being deceived? Yeah, I'm going to get into Democrat and Republican. That's right. Deception. I'm going to find, we're going to find out if we're following another gospel or not. Are you ready? Yeah. I, thought I'd, I thought you'd appreciate that. Okay. I'll hush. It's, it's just a very important thing that we understand how this deception works. The Bible tells us. Now, I'm going to get into three ways that you can test something and know it's the truth. Good. Fail safe. Alan, how can I know it's something? I'm going to give you three ways that our Bible shows us what to do to tell that something's the truth. I want to equip you with that. You'll know what's the truth. Bible says you can know what's the truth. And you can know the will of God. I'm going to show you next week how you can do that. So let's stand and I'll pray. Lord Jesus, we do love you. I thank you, oh God, for the truth of your word. And Lord Jesus, if there's anything I've said that I shouldn't have said, I pray it'll fall to the ground. But Lord Jesus, I hope that there's something I've said has been of you. And if it is, I pray that your Holy Spirit would quicken it to our hearts. It would change our lives, change our mind. It'd give us, it'd give us clear understanding of what we're walking into. And dear God, because we have clearer understanding, we'll understand also your love that you have for us and for each other. Dear God, I pray that this group will be anointed this day that we will bring, oh God, to you and we will not be deceived. Where we've been deceived, that we'll repent. Where we've not been deceived, we'll take heed and we'll stand. Lead us this day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.